Um, for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Michael Fitzgerald, also known on Twitter as Stoic.xmr. Um, the talk today, I'm uh, sorry, the talk I'm going to be giving today is about the Monero Standard, which is a book that I'm writing at the moment. So people ask me, you know, like, what is the book actually about? And I was thinking, well, you know, it's not really about Monero. It's, it's not really about money. It's kind of a convergence of a lot of topics, really. And the best way I thought of describing it is essentially how we can use money to build a long lasting platform for freedom and prosperity. So I suppose to sort of frame it up, we need to first know what is actually stopping freedom and prosperity. So naturally we need to know the problems in order to find a solution, right? So the first problem we come across in society is um, one that probably most people don't know about. Like obviously being at a Monero conference, many people here listening would um, be familiar with it, but many people outside of call it the Monero space, the Bitcoin space, the crypto space in general, even the gold space. M most people don't come in contact with uh, this specific problem, or at least they don't recognize the problem. So the first problem, as I say, is the Fiat Ponzi. And essentially the problem is that there is an arbitrary control of the monetary system. Um, this may or may not seem like an obvious problem to those at first, but we're going to explain why. So. Essentially, what we've seen today in the Fiat Ponzi is financial theft and ultimately time theft via devaluation of money. So just to touch on that quickly, time theft is. Um, think about this. So you go to work, you work to earn money and your money has a certain value. Then the politicians go off and create more of that money, obviously devaluing the current money that you have, the money that you've worked for. So by devaluing that money, they've essentially taken a portion of the time that you've worked and completely stolen it, i.e. the money that you've saved is no longer worth the same amount of time as it was before. It's no longer worth the same amount of goods and resources as it was, uh, goods and services as it was before. Now, the significance of this is that money actually no longer requires proof of work. And talking about another niche concept, proof of work is actually a massively, massively important concept in money when we're, when we're speaking about money. So, Ultimately, when there's no proof of work in a money, there's no limitation to the creation of that money anymore. And ultimately, what that means is there's a distortion of reality. So the markets and outcomes are being totally manipulated. I want to just talk about the um, proof of work example here. So if you have, uh, let's say, two alternative systems, so you have a system where you can essentially print money out of thin air, i.e. you just type in a number on a screen and you have a system where like the real world, like pretty much up until what, 1971, you actually have to go out and work to create money. So generally when we go back to the beginning of time or back to the earliest examples, what has been considered money has often been gold. So you can't just create gold out of thin air. So this obviously contributes to the hardness of the money, how hard it is to create. So considering the fact that it is actually hard to create, it obviously limits how much can be added into circulation and obviously how much, um, how much excess, well, how much devaluation occurs on that money. So all in all, the outcome of what we see in the Fiat Ponzi, which we explore in great depth in the book, it's actually the longest chapter, chapter two called the Fiat Ponzi is what it boils down to is the inevitable collapse and devaluation of the dollar, of fiat currency in general. So the M2 monetary supply, um, it's important to understand sort of the trajectory in which we're going. So the M2 monetary supply is, you know, uh, cash in circulation, bank deposits, things like this. So when we look at, at the amount of uh, money in the system, the trend is um, pretty clear. Right. It's um, it, there's not even a point. I mean, there's m small points in there where it might have a small correction, but a tiny correction. Even lately, we see, you know, 21, uh, sorry, 2021, 2022. There's a small correction. But in the overall grand scheme of things, the trend is very clear. So it was down at eight hundred billion dollars in 1971. So those of you who are familiar um, with, uh, let's call it uh, monetary theory, 1971 is a very, very infamous year. And that was the year that. Uh, Richard Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. So when gold stopped back in the dollar. 
1971, there was approximately $800 billion worth of uh, dollars in the system to today where we see, you know, about 21, just over $21 trillion. Uh, trillion. So what this has ultimately meant is, I mean, people talk about inflation, i.e. Uh, prices going up be inflation, but that's not inflation at all. The actual definition of inflation is the expansion of the monetary supply, what we just saw before, M2 monetary supply uh, going up. So as a consequence of inflation, prices go up and obviously purchasing power goes down. So what this chart shows going from 1971 to today is six point. So in essence, you need 6.48 times more dollars today as opposed to 1971 just to keep up with inflation, if you will. So the cost of goods, sorry, just to keep up with the cost of goods and services, not to lose your purchasing power at all. And as I say, that's not making money or making goods and services or making purchasing power versus goods and services. This is just to keep up with the rising prices. So as I say, this essentially means that they steal your life, right? The previous charts show us exactly that, that they steal your time. So as I say, money is essentially proof of work, right? Money is a store of energy, your time spent working. So as we mentioned, they're able to do that via arbitrarily increasing and decreasing the supply of money. As we mentioned, money no longer requires proof of work. There's no limitation to creation of money and obviously the devaluation of the money in the system, i.e. those dollars in the system or euros or uh, yeah, even Australia has dollars, whatever currency you want to choose, right? And I think a very important philosophical point about this is that the fiat system has essentially created an entire system based on moral hazard. So those who make the decisions uh, are essentially detached from the, the consequences of those decisions, right? So when a politician uh, makes or, you know, en en enacts a, a law, for example, or enacts a policy, spending on healthcare or, it doesn't actually matter what it is. They're essentially printing money, i.e. stealing that purchasing power from you and giving it to their own agenda, i.e. their attempt to buy votes. So they're not actually attached to the consequences of their decisions anymore. Traditionally, you'd have to go out and produce something. And then obviously, given the, the principles of proof of work, you're incentivized to make good decisions with your money, as opposed to wasteful decisions, which we see in politics. And that's what the, that's what the fiat system enables. So we need to essentially figure out what well obviously we know the direction but the question is is it going to turn around because that's really our only hope at this stage short of an, a completely different system whether or not it's going to turn around is our only hope so as we see the direction's very clear right it's gone from you know as we saw before 800 trillion dollars to 21 trillion dollars in m2 but government debt is actually a main driver of the increase in the M2 money supply in a roundabout way. It's not so direct as print money goes into the system. It actually fil flows down and filters through the system. So looking at this, right, government debt is also on a very, very, very clear trajectory. So this is actually an old chart. This, this chart is from, I believe, February this year when I was giving the presentation in Anarchapulco. The, as you would have seen recently, the amount of federal debt has just surpassed $32 trillion, which is a, a staggering amount, right? And that doesn't take into account unfunded liabilities, which we'll talk about next. But as we see, the trend is very, very clear. So again, this is an old chart. This is from, I believe, about a month and a half ago, I believe early May. So if anyone's unfamiliar with this, this is actually usdebtclock.com. Uh, so it shows a whole bunch of uh, economic statistics related to the United States. So top left, we see, I don't know if you guys can see the amounts, but we see in the top left, the US national debt sitting at over, well, now it's over $32 trillion. Now looking at whether it's going to turn around, as we're just speaking about, we see the deficit here. And again, I was checking this last night, the official US deficit is over $1.5 trillion and the actual US deficit is now over $1.6 trillion. 
So not is it only in the negative, but the deficit's becoming larger and larger and larger. And this this creates a a, a massive problem. You know, the, the trend is obviously becoming very clear. Another one I want to talk about is the US federal debt to GDP ratio at 120%. So debt is 120% of GDP. So for every dollar of GDP you have, you have $1.2 of debt, which is staggering. So a fun fact about that is every nation who's gone over 130% or roughly 135% has never, ever come back. I think there's Japan currently, I think there's like Greece and a couple other nations. But historically, no country has ever gone into it and come back out of it. There's Once they've gone into it, it's just gone downhill. Um, some other things about when we're talking about assessing whether, where the trend is going and whether it's going to turn around is looking at some of the economic statistics such as manufacturing. So wealth is not money. Wealth is actually real goods and services. So when you're producing less things, the money is completely irrelevant. So as we see, manufacturing jobs have obviously been exporting. You don't have to be a genius to figure this out. They're obviously heading over to China and India and cheaper labor places. So within within America, manufacturing jobs have jumped from 17.2 million people to just over 13 million jobs. Other staggering ones are things like the US workforce, right? So in 2000, the workforce was 160 million. And now it's, I'm sorry, 160.2 million. And now, uh, as of today, 23 years later, it's 161.7 million. So only an increase of 1.5 million people. On the other end of that scale, the people not in the workforce, that that's had a massive, massive increase, right? So not in labor force today. Actually, as I was saying, I was checking this just before, it's now gone over 100 million people. So there's now over 100 million people out of what is it, roughly 350 million people who are not in the workforce at all, not in the labor force. And if you compare that to 2000, the people in the, not in the labor force in 2000, what's obviously, as you see here, just under 82 million people. Now, as I mentioned before about the unfunded liabilities, so that's, again, if we look down here, if you can see my mouse in the bottom right corner, the second one in, um, the unfunded liabilities is just on this one, uh, past $187 trillion. But it, as I was checking yesterday, it's now over $190 trillion. So this takes into account. So again, when we're looking at what's going to happen in the future, right? These unfunded liabilities is really the final nail in the coffin. So the unfunded liabilities is things like, you know, Medicare, Social Security, um, and things like this, things that need to be paid for in the future, but aren't due just yet. But the un that's a liability. But the unfunded part is they don't actually know where the money is going to come from. It's completely unfunded. They're just going to, well, they're going to have to figure it out. And presumably that's going to mean they're going to have to print, right? So the only solution, the mathematical only solution to financing all of this is to print more money. There's no plausible circumstance in which people are going to be able to produce enough goods and services to be able to pay for all of this. The only solution is printing more money. Now, the second problem that I want to talk about, and the second problem that we talk about in the book, is uh, essentially globalism and technocracy. So we're going to look at uh, the global hierarchy and their agendas. And this isn't agendas, what I think they're going to do. This, these are publicly stated agendas that are on their websites, for example. So again, this isn't getting into any conspiracy at all. This is just um, a basic knowledge, if you will. All it does is taking a little bit of understanding. So this is essentially the globalist or the global power structure, if you will. So as you see at the top, we have the BIS, the Central Bank of Central Banks, as it's notoriously known, <laughs> run by Jallyman Augustin Carstens, which I'm sure a few of you guys know. And obviously in that um, top bracket, you have the other central banks, the Federal Reserve, the ECB, the Reserve Bank of Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, below them, you have the global think tanks. These guys are the policy distributors. These are the guys who uh, do the academic research, if you will, to, to um, provide a, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? To provide a justification for why they should be adopted. 
Below them, you have the intergovernmental organizations. One, per, one um, logo I don't have on there is USA. That's another good example of the intergovernmental organizations. Uh, below them, governments, houses and nobility. Generally, a lot of people would think they'd actually be higher up, but they're not. And below them, we actually have uh, some of the largest enforcers, which is uh, business. So we, we break this down in length and there is no speculation in the length in which we break it down. It's all bringing all the receipts. But two points I want to highlight for the sake of the speech without going on a, you know, a, a one hour tangent about it all is it's important to understand the interconnectivity of all of these layers. Right. So from uh, business, you have people filtering into government. Obviously, a lot of people go from government to business, business to government. From government, you have a lot of people who are assigned to positions at the UN, at the IMF, the World Bank, et cetera, et cetera. You also have people coming from businesses, so JP Morgan um, and all these large banks going into uh, not only the, the central banks and the BIS, but also going into places like the IMF and the World Bank, et cetera, et cetera. And again, uh, yeah, startling, probably not so startling uh, lead to a lot of you guys is Again, Larry Fink of BlackRock from the business sector is uh, on the board of uh, trustees for the global think tanks at the World Economic Forum. So the point I wanted to make is I just want to talk about the amount of interconnectivity between these layers. And this is not some conspiracy. They're all out to get us. This is just pointing out that there is actually a lot of in interconnectivity between these layers. And I want to talk now about their publicly stated agendas. So words that I'm absolutely sure you guys are all too familiar with. CBDCs, digital IDs, social credit scores. Three massive agendas that are pointed out by pretty much all of these, not, not all of them all together, but certainly uh, a lot of them talk about a lot of these concepts. See, the BIS talks about digital IDs. Uh, the World Economic Forum talks about all three of them. Again, BIS, central banks, they're all talking about CBDCs. Um, and governments, obviously, we know this. So the first one, the first agenda or the first tool that they want to implement is CBDCs, which is completely programmable money. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with CBDCs, um, but essentially CBDCs allow you to manipulate any aspect of a currency, right? So essentially you lose all your monetary freedom and this can be in terms of time limits. So whether it's you directly, you lose your money, whether it's setting negative interest rates, um, it can also be you can restrict on spending areas. So that could be econ uh, nationally economic, uh, sorry, nationally important industries. Say, let's just make something up like uh, uh, cattle production in Australia or wheat production. It doesn't actually matter what it is, but nationally important industries. This is just an example of how they could restrict your spending. And essentially, you lose access to your bank for unapproved transactions. So again, participating in unapproved activities kind of goes full circle around to the social credit scores, but participating in un unapproved activities such as protesting during COVID lockdowns or anything like that can essentially mean they can shut off your money and it's over. You've, built, you've lost your money for now. Um, and essentially when you lose your monetary freedom, it's actually much more important than probably most people realize you actually lose your freedom to expression, which is really what monetary communication is, is you're expressing your preferences in the world. And ultimately through things like time limits and, um, and negative interest rates, you lose your right to store wealth, which, which are two massive problems. So digital IDs, again, I'm sure a lot of you guys are very, very familiar with this. Um, so essentially a digital ID system can come in many forms. It can come in something as simple as, you know, a driver's license or anything like this and essentially be just something on your phone where you have your phone, uh, sorry, your ID linked to something like your phone. And But the really scary part about this is that they can implement something quite as simple as, you know, vaccine passports. Um, they can implement movement licenses and the old saying is if you've got nothing to hide, well, if you're doing nothing wrong, then you have nothing to hide, right? But this isn't really the point. The whole point is about, is this a tool? It, it, historically speaking, is this the direction we want society to be heading? Historically speaking, how many societies have implemented systems like this? Not so much digital IDs, but movement licenses and things like this. And being, you know, a truly free and not only free, but a prosperous society as well. 
even for those who don't care about freedom. Prosperity is something that surely everybody cares about, the prosperity of you, your children, your loved ones, and uh, your ability to um, achieve what you want in life. And the last publicly stated gender that we're going to be talking about is social credit scores. So as I mentioned, CBDCs and digital IDs pave the way for a social credit score system, or even a social credit score system can come in the form of a carbon credit score. And this can obviously be a system set by governments or businesses um, to rank you and determine what activities you're allowed to do based on how good of a citizen you are. So as we see in China currently, <laughs> if you buy too much alcohol, your social credit score goes down. If you talk badly about on WeChat, if you talk badly about the CCP or Xi Jinping, social credit score goes down. If you don't visit your elderly grandparents enough, again, that's seen as a desirable characteristic in Chinese society, social credit score goes down. And on the other side of that, buying baby formula when you have uh, children seen as a good thing. So social credit scores really lay the platform to lose pretty much all freedom we have in society. Um, and, and against the question, do you, is this the world you want to be living in when we're talking about these agendas? So the question is, you know, how do we actually fix this, right? So we're going to discuss uh, proof of work and privacy, how both proof of work and privacy fix this. So step one, proof of work actually provides long-term prosperity because it fixes the problem of the fiat Ponzi. So because you're now limited by spending real world resources to obtain Monero, i.e. like you would be with gold, um, you can no, people can no longer steal your time and you can no longer steal other people's time. The monetary policy is obviously set in stone. No centralized authority can change it. Only the user of the network can agree to participate in it or not. And importantly to the consequences of decisions, as we we're talking about before, are actually retied to those who are making decisions. So you can no longer obtain money without real world productivity. And secondly, privacy provides long term freedom by essentially uh, hitting out of the park all those agendas that we talked about before, all those dystopian globalist agendas we talked about before. So pro pro privacy enables us as a human species to have monetary freedom again. It protects you financially and essentially it just allows you to interact as you see fit. As I say, it gives you autonomy over money and having autonomy over money is the most true form of expression. I mean, monetary behavior is the most pure form of human behavior. So and societies can now base on true demands and economies form that don't require third party approval. So when we're talking about before about how they distort markets, this touches back on that point. So when they print a bunch of money and uh, filter it into, it doesn't matter what industry, it distorts uh, signals for entrepreneurs, for inter, in, sorry, inventors, etc. So if they're seeing a whole lot of economic activity over in one area, they're more likely to go over there and join that. Whereas if we have it all based on natural human behavior and monetary freedom, we start to see products, goods and services that better reflects the real desires and uh, I suppose the wants of, of humans as a, as a species. So stacking up the cards, we have about 20 points to stack up the cards real quick. One, fiat money is not real money. Two, the fiat monetary system benefits only those closest to the monetary spigot. Three, obviously, fiat's a Ponzi. Four, an alternative money system, monetary system will be needed. Five, reform cannot change the system. And that's even if fiat wasn't a Ponzi. This number five is something we talk about extensively in the book and we give some historical precedence to it. Six, rev yeah, again, this has got an entire chapter devoted to it, revolutionary cycles. Now, revolutionary cycles are all converging at this point in time. I mean, what a time to be alive. We have the 50 year technological revolution, the 80 year political slash societal revolution, and a 250 empire, uh, empirical revolution, if you will, are all converging at this point in history. Now, not only these ones, but we also have short and long-term debt cycles converging at this point, which is a concept that Ray Dalio talks about quite extensively. We have generational cycles are converging altogether. So to break that down, it's uh, essentially about the good times create um, 
Uh, weak men, weak men create hard times. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. 10, the globalist power structure has immense power, like, you know, to essentially to implement their outlined socialist, uh, dystopian socialist agendas. Um, a few, 11, a future filled with technocracy and globalism will only serve to increase centralization, reduce individual liberty, serve to benefit the very few elites closest to the monetary spigot, and reduce the prosperity of probably not just the only, not just only the average person, but human humans as a top, as a as a whole, if you will. Twelve, naturally, you can expect very strong efforts to be made by the current establishment to keep their place at the top of the food chain. 13, any efforts to deplatform the global, globalist power structure will be met with stiff militant resistance. 14, the solution to technocracy and globalism is a decentralization and privatization of money. As we spoke about, the two main problems are fiat and technocracy slash globalism. 16, the solution to fake fiat money is hard proof of work money that has real world value and provides real world as utility to people and essentially can't be manipulated or fucked with, if you will. 17, the solution to technocracy slash globalism is privacy tools and technologies that can't be stopped. And it's important at the end of the day, that comes down to mathematics, right? So the best method of maths is the one that should be chosen. So whatever achieves the best results, that method of maths should be uh, chosen, essentially. And as we see by our demands, Monero is actually that method. M Monero is a decentralized, private, and proof of work money. So Monero essentially provides the best basis we've ever had as a species for long-term freedom and equality of opportunity. So for freedom and prosperity, Monero actually provides that. So the move to the Monero standard, right? So we just spoke about a lot of these new technologies adopted according to the perceived value to the user. Unfortunately, difficult times need to happen in, in order for humans to have the incentive to adopt Monero. We've spoken about these difficult times coming. Um, Fiat's going to force people to look for alternative monies. Um, as the increased devaluation of Fiat continues to happen, probabilistically speaking, people are more likely to look for alternatives and obviously more likely to find Monero as that solution. So with the dystopian world we are moving to, people are also going to be a force to adopt new monetary networks with complete privacy that best suit their goals or best, best reflect their values, if you will. So what does it actually look like, right? What does the road to a Monero standard look like, so to say? So I have a few things outlined here, and I don't think it's actually that important that all of them play out or uh, anything like that. So, but what we will see, and, and certainly we're going to see a lot of these happen, but not necessarily all of them, is continued adoption on the dark nets and black markets. That, that's a leading indicator for providing value to a market. Cash, I'm sure a lot of you guys will agree cash is going to be banned. CBDCs are going to be introduced to control what people can buy and sell based on social credit scores, digital IDs, uh, social credit systems, as I mentioned. Um, culturally speaking, we already see a massive shift in people's um, caring about personal or business privacy. I mean, from 10 years ago or from 20 years ago, I feel like the, um, the cultural difference is absolutely massive. A lot more people care about privacy now than even 10 years ago, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Again, go go full tinfoil hat conspiracy here. I think commonly good, desired goods such as meat and salt will be banned. I mean, the World Economic Forum's talked about this, uh, so-called eat the bugs, right? Um, these are openly talked about agendas. Um, another one that will, I think, likely happen on the road to a Monero standard, uh, because I think if it doesn't, then probably we're, we're heading towards a Bitcoin standard because Bitcoin has is, a, in my opinion, a very important cultural revolution and it has massive network effects currently. So I, I predict that Bitcoin and other transparent protocols will be heavily regulated, tracked and manipulated. And we're already seeing that. We're already seeing a lot of DeFi becoming regulated, um, talks of DeFi implementing KYC. And this all comes back to, I suppose, on a bit of a side note, but it always comes back to the centralization of the protocols. And I'm not saying Bitcoin is centralized, but many of these other protocols, these DeFi protocols are certainly centralized. They have teams, 
They have, uh, let's sometimes, in some cases, master nodes, very few nodes, high requirements for nodes. Um, we're going to see more people discriminated against for events such as the Canadian trucker protests and the Dutch farmer protests. We're going to see adoption in uh, small nations. Adoption is legal tender as well. It doesn't matter if it's small nation, large nation. It doesn't even matter if it's no nation because essentially Monero isn't here to take part, right? It's here to take over. That's fundamentally the difference. So, and again, taxes paid in Monero would be awesome. Not necessary to happen. Um, I think something we will see, and it's again, not necessary for it to happen, but it's certainly something that seems likely to happen is the extreme volatility in markets, whether that be of Monero or gold or commodities and stocks, whatever in general, as lawmakers become increasingly irrational and, and desperate, as do all the rulers towards the end of every empire in history so far. So uh, the perfect example of that is gold. I don't know if anyone, if you guys have seen the chart, gold, um, in the Weimar Republic in the twenties, right? So I, uh, I don't want to misquote, but the price of gold, you'd see, you know, it'd be up a thousand percent next month. It'd be down 90%. Next month it'd be up 200%. Next month down 50%. Next month up 10,000%. I'm making up the numbers, but the volatility is absolutely massive. And this can shake out a lot of people, people who don't have conviction. So it's important to know what we're going to see on the road, i.e. the extreme volatility in order to prepare yourself uh, for what's going to happen. And to be able to see the bigger picture, this won't be the first time in history this happens. So what, what can you guys do, right? I'm sure being at a Monero conference, many of you people are, many of you guys are already doing some of these things. Um, maybe, hopefully as many as possible. Certainly I'm trying to do as many as possible. So the average Joe can obviously try and make a co cultural home base, say like a El Salvador for Bitcoin. Uh, you can, like myself, write books about Monero and trust me, if I can do it, I can assure you anyone can do it if you put enough time and effort into it. Um, academic level courses, this goes back to a sort of a Marxist ideology of infiltrating the institutions, if you will. Um, more XMR YouTube videos, another thing I'm doing with Monero magazine as well, trying to spread the, spread the, not even spread the message like a, a cult or anything like that, but get the information out there and in so many different formats, because there's a lot of different people, a lot of different markets, a lot of people from different experiences in life and each person who uh, say for example in this case comes in and starts making videos this just increases the opportunity and increases the chances of somebody finding content that relates to them and finding content that's understandable by them uh, you can every single person can and as i have been doing lobbying politicians to make monero friendly laws or at minimum make laws that don't ban it from exchanges and all these kind of ludicrous laws. I haven't, I haven't had too much luck so far, I will, I will declare, but what have we had? We've had no replies from three, three, so one house of rep and two senators we've had no replies from. Um, anyone can obviously onboard new users, whether that's doing something like, you know, Doug does, just giving out tips to people, whether that's, uh, you know, having conversations with family and friends or whatever. Any single person, as I've been doing now that I've arrived back in Australia, I've been hosting events like Doug does in New York, like I'm sure many people do all around the world. Like for example, MoneroCon, where we're at right now, anyone can host events. It doesn't have to be a massive event like MoneroCon. It can be just like what I've been doing. Invite some people, see who turns up. So far, there's been two people turn up. Hey, it's better than nothing. Anybody can obviously run nodes and commit hash and power to the network. And the beauty of that is you don't need any specialized hardware, right? You can do it with the laptop using at the moment. I mean, I can do it off the laptop I'm streaming from right now, right? In fact, I do do it from the laptop I stream with, just not right now. Uh, obviously, developers, you guys can make browser wallets. I've seen some in production. Um, Cake Wallet does a great job at yeah, user experience wallets. But again, more options, the better. Uh, Monero Yo is also does a great one for user experience while it's keeping it simple. Atomic swaps, DeFi bridges, uh, Monero only exchanges, that would be cool. Big tech resistant wallets, that's another one that's massively important. What's going to happen when uh, laws are made that Google Play and the Apple Store can't list these wallets anymore, can't have them in the App Store. So we need to have the option to have uh, big tech resistant infrastructure, not only on the protocol level, but also on the user level, i.e. wallets. Um, and obviously integration with other web applications would be super phenomenal as well. 
Um, in terms of building a circular economy, things that everyone can do, again, in real world places that accept Monero, right? So you can go and try and pay for your meat, pay for your vegetables, go down to a local uh, you know, shop and try and pay in Monero. Other side of that, if you own a business, accept Monero. I mean, chances are that you're going to have essentially nobody that pays you in Monero. And in a way, that's all the more reason to do it because you don't have to take the risk with so-called volatility, right? Um, you can accept Monero, do a philanthropic uh, thing, if you will, um, and yeah, help Monero in general. And help your business. You're going to essentially be getting more people uh, come to your business because you accept Monero. Um, we need to get wholesalers and manufacturers accepting Monero, wages paid in Monero. Uh, that's probably the dream of many people here, right? Commodities priced in Monero, spend Monero on as many things as you can. Spend Monero on food, rent, healthcare, goods, services, and also see community tipping within the economy. Uh, Monero VCs would be a really cool idea. Uh, Monero GoFundMe alternatives, Monero marketplaces like uh, eBay and Amazon. In fact, I've seen one pop up over the last few months, MoneroMarket.io. I just bought something off there, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's, it's a really pleasant experience. It's a great website. Um, Monero payment rail companies like Square, uh, Monero companies in general. And another thing is just uh, spreading the good message of privacy, if you will, and obviously partnering with human rights organizations, NGOs. That's obviously more of a centralized effort. Um, and just very quickly, um, as I've mentioned, the book I'm writing at the moment is called The Monero Standard. Um, it's actually not available now. It's still in pre-sale. I'm actually uploading it to the publisher at the moment. So it'll be ready whenever that'll be in the next week or two. And I'll start sending copies out beyond that. Um, but in essence, you can head over to monerostandard.com, pre-order yourself a copy, pay in Monero. We accept other cryptos uh, as well. We don't accept fear currently. Um, and guys, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak at MoneroCon. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, you have... No idea how much I wish I could be there in person. I'm over here stuck in Australia. Um, and same with Monerotopia. I'm incredibly jealous I can't be there. But thank you very much for having me.